Good morning, and welcome to another episode of Old Men in Chairs. I am not going to be doing any music reactions today. I am going to react to the speech given the other night by our fearless leader. I think this cartoon sums up my feelings about it pretty well. Old Man Yells at Country. I'll be honest, I couldn't last more than about five minutes into the speech, but I got the gist of it. Very much an angry speech. And who was he angry at? Mainly the people in his own country who don't agree with him. If you've gotten this far in the video, then you probably realize where I stand on these things. And if it's not your philosophy, save yourself a little bit of heartache and just change the channel right now. I'm going to show you a little bit of the speech and then I'm going to reflect a little bit upon the parallels between what he was doing and the famous two minute hate scene from the movie 1984. Good evening. If I were smart, I'd go home now. That's probably the only part of the speech that I, I will agree with. It might have been better not to have given any speech than the speech that he gave. In January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation. And he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. That may be true, <laughs> but the people that are assaulting freedom and democracy are being led by the gentleman on the screen. Of course, that's not what he's trying to say. He's trying to say that those who oppose him are opposing freedom and democracy. Nothing could be further from the truth. The people that oppose him want to restore the freedoms that we've always enjoyed in this country, the freedom of speech, the freedom to assemble and redress our grievances, the freedom to have elect our own leaders. What makes our moment rare is the freedom of democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas at the very same time. <clears throat> overseas, Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. I believe that Putin will stop at Ukraine, and I believe that Putin never would have even gone into Ukraine if it hadn't been for provocation, chiefly instigated by the United States and their NATO allies, who were deliberately poking the big bear. Why they do that, I'm not sure. It may have a lot to do with wanting to sell a lot of military equipment, test out some new military equipment. It's not about peace, I can tell you that. Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that needs to defend itself. I don't believe that's true either. We've been supplying them all kinds of weapons for two years and they don't seem to be able to stop the Russians. At best, they have a bloody standstill where they're losing hundreds of thousands of the flower of their youth and actually some men that are not so young. But this is a big pitch, you know, to pass his bill to get more money for Ukraine, money that will probably end up in everybody else's pockets besides the people of Ukraine who actually need it. That is all Ukraine is asking. They're not asking for American soldiers. In fact, there are no American soldiers at war in Ukraine. I think that's another lie. I'm sure there are American advisors who are in the military helping Ukraine in many, many ways, helping them to operate our high-tech equipment. 
This is where he loses me. He starts the speech, and, and it's a nonstop series of lies. I'm not going to stop and fact-check them all, but just look at uh, the speaker to his, to his right behind him, Mr. Johnson. His facial expressions will pretty much indicate when Joe is lying, and pretty much every time Joe's mouth is moving, he's lying. How many times when he was present? After another shooting in Iowa recently, he said, when I spoke to him, I said, just get over it. But now, <laughs> assistance to Ukraine is being blocked by those who want to walk away from our world leadership. It wasn't long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, in fact, they did tear down the wall, and the communist regime went bye-bye. So now we have a Russia who, in many ways, is more capitalist than the United States. And so why are we still fighting them? Why are they still the big bugaboo? We've always been at war with East Asia and Eurasia. Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. Another lie, of course, another misquote, but this is what we've come to expect. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. Less than five minutes into this speech, he's turned it into a partisan attack on his opponent in the upcoming election, misrepresenting his words. But he's throwing red meat to the base. This is what the people who suffer from Trump derangement syndrome want to hear. They want to hear orange man bad. So they're going to get their belly full of orange man bad. America is a founding member of NATO. The military alliance of democratic nations created after World War II prevent, to prevent war and keep the peace. And today, We've made NATO stronger than ever. We welcomed Finland to the alliance last year. And just this morning, Sweden officially joined, and their minister is here tonight. Can they stand up? Okay, but the part they leave out is that Ukraine is not part of NATO. So technically, we have no legal duty to protect Ukraine from the Russians, nor do we have that much of a national interest in doing so. At least uh, the Russian-speaking eastern provinces of Ukraine, which are very close to Russia. History is watching. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk. Europe is at risk. The free world will be at risk, emboldening others to do what they wish to do us harm. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. Do you mean like the way you walked away from Afghanistan and left billions of dollars of weapons behind? You say that's not going to happen in Ukraine? History is watching, just like history watched three years ago on January 6th, when insurrections stormed this very capital and placed the dagger to the throat of American democracy. I guess you get the gist. Now he's going to switch. You know, he's created the devil and Mr. Putin, the evil Eurasia that we've always been at war with. And now he's going to flip and compare what happened on January 6th as equally as bad, equally as dangerous as anything that's ever happened in the United States history, all the way back to the Civil War. To which I could say, bullshit. But... Why does he say this? This is all part of a carefully thought out strategy. And at this point, I want to show you where that strategy comes from, because it's perfectly portrayed in the novel 1984 with the concept of the hate speech. A hate speech was a daily requirement that all citizens had to listen to so they could renew their hatred for the opponents, not just the Eurasia and Oceania, depending on which one we were at war with at that moment, but also the internal opponents. In our current world, it's the Trumps and the MAGA people 
who are supposedly the greatest threat to democracy and freedom. But in the novel 1984, it was somebody named Goldstein. Goldstein, Trump, it's all the same thing. We have to be trained to hate the other side. Let's show a little bit of that movie. So this is the opening scene from the 1984 film of the book 1984 by George Orwell. And you see the letters I-N-G-S-O-C. That's the controlling party in this fictional society, the English Socialist Party. This is a rally, the two-minute hate rally that occurs daily and which all citizens are required to partake. Let's watch a little bit of this. This is our land. A land of peace and of plenty. A land of harmony and hope. This is our land. Oceania. These are our people. The workers. The strivers. The builders. These are our people. The builders of our world. Struggling. Fighting. Bleeding. Dying. On the streets of our cities and on the far-flung battlefields. Fighting against the mutilation of our hopes and dreams. Who are they? They are the dark armies. The dark, murdering armies of Eurasia. In the barren deserts of Africa and India. On the oceans of Australasia, courage, strength and youth are sacrificed. Sacrificed to barbarians whose only honor is atrocity. As we grasp at victory, there is a cancer, an evil tumor, growing, spreading in our midst. Shout! Shout! Shout out his name! They start out by talking about how wonderful a country and the people of our land, Oceania, is. And then they talk about the horrible people of Eurasia, the evil people that are killing our youth and threatening our democracy. But then they turn and say, but there's something even worse, a cancer growing in our country, a cancer of people who are just as bad as those evil enemies on the other side of the world. Goldstein, Goldstein and his followers. Now, I like this particular version of the movie because what Goldstein is actually saying is pretty much drowned out by the screams of hatred from the crowd, but it has the subtitles there, so I, I encourage you to read them. In fact, I'm going to put on my glasses so I can read them a little better. What Goldstein is saying is very much echoed by what a lot of us are saying right now, that we are being lied to by the state. He mentions false flags, operations against the citizens. He basically encourages people to think for themselves. Of course, everything he's saying is falling on deaf ears.
you're being made into obedient, stupid slaves of the party. I'm afraid that describes a lot of people. Nowadays, it's not just the two minutes of hate. If you watch certain television stations or news cable outlets or read certain newspapers, you could be immersed in hate of the other side pretty much 24-7. That's how much more powerful the indoctrination is today. So that's how they do it. <laughs> they create hate among the people that believe their propaganda, hatred of the other side. And those who try to tell them to throw off their yoke and not believe all the lies they're being told are hated all the more. Now, we had an interesting example last week how that hate can turn what many thought was a fairly reasonable person into a person of hate. So, of course, I'm referring to the comments of Charles Barkley, who was on CNN and threatened to punch any black person that he saw wearing a pro-Trump t-shirt. I've had some difficulty finding that clip. I think it's been washed from the internet he went back a day or two later and put up an apology video in which he said, oh, no, of course, I didn't really mean what I said. But if you look at the original here, he looks like he's pretty serious about what he said. You know who embraced it more than anybody else? The black population. It's incredible. You see black people walking around with my mugshot. You know, they do shirts. When you heard that, what did you think? <sighs> Big sigh. <laughs> First of all, I'm just going to say this. If I see a black person walking around with Trump mugs, I'm going to punch him in the face. Charles. Uh, no, Gail, 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 Gail. You, I, you really can't say that, because, A, you don't mean that. You, oh, I mean that sincerely. <laughs> I'm going to just tell you something. And then you will be arrested for assault. And then what? I'm going to bail myself what? out and go celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> if I see don't encourage scissor. him. Don't... He seems pretty serious to me. And that's the type of hate that they need to foment in order to keep control of the country, to get everyone to come out and vote for the regime. It's the same type of hate that is uh, fomented in that two-minute hate. And you can see it's working on certain people who have been continually brainwashed for going on six years now that the orange man is bad, and anyone who supports the orange man is bad. And the orange man is racist. So obviously, any black person that would support Donald Trump is a traitor to his own people. And the fact that Charles Barkley, who most people think is a pretty reasonable guy in general, a very funny personality, most of us admire Charles for his straight talking. But the fact that they can get even to him and have him spew such hatred and nonsense, it should be a wake-up call for everybody. Those are my impressions of the, the State of the Union. I didn't watch the whole thing, but I watched enough to figure out what the game was.